cannot share the screen, right? Can you see the screen? No? Not yet. Let me just try that. Yes, yes. Now we see it. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Floor is yours. Is that, is that okay? Cool. Yes, okay. So, yeah, so this is the this, uh, ongoing project for like a bunch of years. So this is like second paper of the same same project with different people. Um, so the idea is basically, this is all related to finance. I could have also like, I have two other projects more related to more cross-section stuff. Uh, but um, since I'm, I'm doing this and I finished this and, um, and presented this in the World Congress, recently i decided to do finance stuff um uh, and since this is ready the others are not and there's a gmm stuff but it's kind of old so uh, this will be related to finance and i think how many i have like half an hour or one hour okay so i'm guessing uh, i have like um an hour so uh, basically, uh, what I'm trying to do here is with Marcelo and Gabriel is um, trying to kind of like look at the sharp ratio when the portfolio size is much larger than the time span. And the issue is we don't know like what's going on in these cases. Uh, so it, there's some kind of difficulty in that in terms of mathematics difficulty to analyze these issues. And we try to solve this by by a new machine learning tool, uh, not so new, but I mean to the to the finance people, I think it will be entirely new. So um, what is sharp ratio? Sharp ratio is basically return divided by the standard deviation. So for a given unit metric of standard deviation, uh, if you think as a risk, yeah, you would like to see your return. This is called the sharp ratio. So the higher sharp ratio, the better your portfolio is. And there are several ways of like um, analyzing the sharp ratio, but like almost all of them that I have seen depends on the precision metrics estimation. So precision metrics estimation is, is the biggest input inside this um, sharp ratio and it has to be carefully calibrated. So what is the formula? Like I said, the formula for the sharp ratio is basically weight times the mu, mu is the target return. So the, the numerator is your return from your portfolio and denominator is your the standard deviation of the portfolio. So um, if you solve this problem, this is an unconstrained problem and we got a formula. There's a closed form solution. It's basically target return precision metrics times the target returns to query root. This is this formula here uh, in this bullet point. And mu is our uh, target returns. It might be like 10%. Um, uh, it might be different in each uh, stock. So we expect like 10% from IBM, 5% from Apple, so, so on and so forth. And this is the precision metric sigma inverse. And basically it's, uh, Excess asset returns is calculated from excess asset returns. And then you look at the covariance and you invert it in population wise, of course, and then you get the result. So when the number of assets is greater than the time spent, we cannot basically plug in. We cannot use a sample covariance uh, inverse. It's not possible because of the singularity. Um, so this, this is the major issue there. So in that sense, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of, it's a big deal actually. So, um, you cannot use any plugin, anything. So, um, of course, related to that is the, the second portion of the paper is basically, okay, that's, if that's the case, one issue is, one major issue is out of sample maximum sharp ratio, which is slightly different than the formula that I did. And the difference is basically, you're gonna estimate the weights in the sharp ratio, you're gonna leave the target return and the so-called um, um, sigma, the covariance, population covariance intact. So in, in one sense, what you're doing is like you're estimating the weights and then you're kind of like, you're creating this auto sample ratio, which is different than the regular maximum sharp ratio. And this is done in, in finance literature. So this is not what, what we did or we found. So we are using whatever else is using. Our main contribution will be different. So basically in a, like seven years ago, the first person to show that if you put, put a plug in estimate, even if a P is less than N and you cannot estimate this uh, out of sample sharp ratio, it will be inconsistent. So there are two broad groups of um, people analyzing these issues um, to get like a consistent sharp ratio or at least get a better result. The first group, I will consider them like the factor model persons and the second group will be shrinkage. Uh, factor model is basically like language in, in finance. So factor model is super dominant. And I will say like a, a lesser case is for shrinkage methods. 
why factor models are dominant. So in, in, the, in the data, they kind of see that uh, the French pharma three factor model explains some of the things in the past. Um, so basically, um, if you look at the factor models, there are several ways of uh, analyzing the factor models. There's a very recent one by uh, Ao and uh, Ying Ying Li in review of financial studies. So they, they use a really fancy way when uh, P is less than N case. So basically, instead of analyzing a constrained problem of maximum portfolio subject to risk, they have an equivalent unconstrained problem. So what they do is um, they convert this to unconstrained problem, but the problem over there is like they have an infeasible uh, output and an infeasible, um, uh, I think it's um, a feasible uh, regressive. So what they do is they have to estimate first the infeasible scale return and then then they have to, what they do is they kind of like use lasso to, to kind of like uh, choose the portfolio weights. So they use lasso, they use shrinkage as well as factor models in the same paper. So they kind of show that a lasso choice of weights provide uh, very good results. And then if you, if you apply this technique, which is kind of a hybrid technique, if you will, they got a very good um, so-called uh, mean variance efficiency for the first time. So the theorems assume normal returns in the simulations, they also show that heavy tail there is, will you know, pose no problem, but they don't have proofs for that. And simulations show that in, the, in their paper, they, they uh, compared to other factor or shrinkage based methods, they do excellent in terms of uh, out of sample sharp ratio. So this is, this is a very nice paper actually. So shrinkage methods proposed mainly by Oliver Ledeau and Michael Wolf. So there are several versions of the shrinkage method and the most recent one that I, I'm aware of is 2017 uh, Review of Financial Studies paper. And um, then uh, over there, what we kind of see is um, um, uh, basically you're looking at the sample covariance metrics and then you're kind of like increasing the small eigenvalues to a certain extent and then decreasing the larger ones to a certain extent. What is a certain extent? There's an optimal way of doing this. So hence they call this the optimal shrinkage. Optimal shrinkage decides how much you should increase and decrease. And uh, one thing their theorems do not do is that both the factor model paper and this paper is all about out of sample. Uh, sharp ratio. And uh, this paper is different than the other one. This paper, you allow for P larger than N, but they cannot allow P is equal to N. There's a singularity there, so they cannot allow that. And what they do is they look at an optimal loss function in a portfolio and they show that the limit can be estimated, limit can be derived, sorry. And then from the limit, they can optimize the shrinkage function and the limit is basically um, related to the maximum sharp ratio, but it's not clear I mean, you kind of like get some consistency result from uh, maximum sharp ratio because their technique is non-sparse. So the, in, in the sense that um, the shrinkage method usually is non-sparse. So it's good, bad thing is it's not clear like whether it's, it's really uh, consistently estimating the sharp ratio. There is no claim for that. So which is, which is okay. The claim is there's a loss function, loss function can go to a limit and the shrinkage optimally optimizes over the limit, that's it. Um, there's no consistency claim or anything. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of like, um, we're gonna show um, two subsamples. And I in the paper, there's much more to this um, actually. So uh, the first subsample is um, the 17 years between 2000 and 2017. The last one is second subsample is 2005 to 2017. These are out of sample periods that we look at our, in our forecasting exercise and we superimpose factor DGP from French three factors to see whether they are matching the data. And when we look at the data here, what we are seeing is the factor DGP is the blue one, the dash blue one, the dotted blue one. And uh, none of the subsamples look like that. And if you look at the factor DGP, it totally ignores the negative correlation in the data. So it never, it never takes into account. Real life data, you have a lot of negatively correlated sets uh, from a French three factor model totally ignores that. So it doesn't look like it's mapping very well with the, the last 20 years of or 17 years of the data or um, uh, because we have seen two recessions uh, actually in one subsample, the other one we have seen one recession and then uh, whenever you impose the from French three factors, it doesn't, it doesn't do that well. So what do we analyze? We are gonna, 
like the shrinkage and factor models, we are going to look at the maximum out of sample sharp ratio. And um, so what we are going to do is um, instead of the plug-in estimate, so we are going to kind of like propose a node-wise, so-called node-wise regression based estimate. I will talk about this a little bit. Um, and then we analyze mean variance efficiency when P is larger than N. So this will be the first thing that we are going to do. So mean variance efficiency is a big deal. Uh, it's, it's, um, there's only one paper, like I said, in the case of P less than N that drive this. So we would like to look at the mean variance efficiency when P is larger than N in this paper. So what will be the contributions? Like I said, the, the biggest deal is getting consistent mean and variance of the portfolio. Our technique will do that. Um, as far as we know, this will be the first result in, in that scenario. Factor models did it for the case of P less than N. Shrinkage did for large P large N, but there's no consistency result in the shrinkage literature. Um, so, um, of course, the other other thing is whether noise-wise regression, the machine learning stuff is working here or not. Yeah, it is working and machine learning can be applied here in finance. So it's a technical contribution. Uh, this is an artificial contribution in the sense that it should map very well with the stock market. So, and uh, there are also uh, discussions about that in the paper. So what we do is we have heat maps, which um, I should have maybe put as this in a slide. Uh, so heat maps show that the correlations in the US stock market in the last 20 years are such that it's mapping very well with the node wise regression idea. And I will tell what does that mean in a second, I think. Um, so I don't know, I don't know whether there are questions at this point. Can you hear me? Uh, no, we I'm I'm uh, controlling it then uh, no uh, we, we don't have any questions, but you can see also that, yeah, we have one. Should I answer uh, that now? Can you see the, the question and answers in, in your Zoom or I can read the question? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can see it, but I couldn't, I cannot open that, I think. It doesn't open. So uh, let me just try to open. Okay, let me just try to okay. open what is possible. Oh, can you deal with time variance, time varying variance of the portfolio? Huh, good question. Hmm. Um, yeah, time variance of the portfolio, timing, time varying variance of portfolio. So if the portfolios are time varying, variance is time varying, um, we allow for beta mixing in the data, but like I'm trying to see whether the, we allow for sigma squared changing with T. No, we don't, no, we don't. So I should say no. Um, yeah, um, no, we don't. Unfortunately, we do not. We are just looking at these uh, very fixed quantities. Any other questions? Okay. We don't see right now any questions. Other than okay, that. cool. So um, basically, um, I mean, we are kind of like um, looking at the maximum out of some sample sharp ratio. And what we are gonna do is we are gonna, uh, this is the formula. For, for that. Um, so I don't know, maybe I should go one more. Um, okay. So let me just stop here. So out of sample sharp ratio is defined in this way in the sense that, so this is the weight of the out of sample sharp ratio. Uh, what we would like to do is we would like to estimate the mean of the large portfolio. So it will be the weight times the mean, mean will be fixed, not estimated. And then the variance, again, the, the covariance matrix will not be estimated, only weights will be estimated. This is how they calculate the out of sample idea. And when you put into the sharp pressure, you simplify a little bit, and this is the um, this is the formula that they got. Um, so what we're going to do is the theta hat will be our node-wise estimate. So instead of sigma hat inverse estimated, we're going to use that. So the formula is the same. It's just like we use a different um, um, so-called um, precision matrix estimate. So this is one one contribution that we're going to do. The second one is the paper deals with three large sections of finance. The first one is basically um, regular, um, so-called regular uh, maximum sharp ratio in the out of sample context. The second one is the constrained maximum sharp ratio analysis. Uh, and the third one is the two portfolios that's used a lot in the literature, we're gonna analyze that. So the second one is basically, we're gonna look at a certain constraint in the portfolio and that constraint is, what if the portfolio weights add up to one? There's a paper in Journal of Econometrics I think a couple of years ago, which was really cool. And it kind of showed that um, if the portfolio weights up, add up to one and you try to get a uh, formula, that formula will be different 
depending upon where you are um, uh, in, a, in a kind of like um, technical point. So a lot of times you will make the mistake that you are getting the minimum sharp pressure rather than the maximum sharp pressure. Um, so if you apply the formula that we used before in, in, the, in the slides before, the unconstrained one, you're gonna making a huge mistake because you're going in the entirely reverse direction. And they show that this new formula depends upon a technical term. So it's an excellent contribution and they have also other constraints and, and they use fixed uh, number of assets uh, and then large sample size. And then they increase the asset size a little bit, but not to the extent of the time span. So, uh, so this is really cool. So um, what they do is they kind of show that everything depends upon this technical term. You can see this technical term as like uh, some kind of like um, tug returns divided by uh, variances and covariances and added up. It's kind of like summed target uh, return divided by Variances. So if that number is positive or zero, then we have the regular maximum sharp ratio. If it's negative, then you have an entirely different formula and then they show how to calculate the portfolio's weights in that case. So they have like two papers, one in Journal of Econometrics, one in, I think in the risk paper, uh, risk Journal of Risk uh, Analysis or something, some other journal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take their paper and then what you like to do is, their paper kind of looks at this idea of the, this technical term as a given. So if this is the case, what should be the result? If this is the other case, what should be the result? They show that in both cases, they can consistently estimate that in the, in the fixed P case. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to advance the literature in, in two different ways. First, we're gonna look at P larger than N. And second, we're gonna propose a new sharp ratio depending upon where you are. So we are gonna have like a one step solution in the sense that depending upon this, um, depending upon this technical term, you are gonna go one way or other, and we would like to take into account this uncertainty uh, of the first term into our new maximum sharp ratio squared. So, um, so we, use, um, we use supervised learning. It's uh, some form of machine learning, of course, it's called node-wise regression. So this will provide an estimate for the precision matrix, and I can kind of like uh, give a close form solution for that. Uh, uh, I don't think I will have time for that. So I rather kind of like concentrate on the node-wise regression estimate rather than show you why that's, that should be the case, why it makes sense. Um, but slides have the formula. Slides have like starts with a formula and, and does it. Mehmet, Mehmet you, have, uh, you have time until, until noon. So you have 40 minutes. You have four minutes, okay. So should I, should I, I don't know whether should I use that or not. I mean, no, it's up to you. Maybe I should. You so, have okay. more minutes, yes. So, uh, so okay. Time-wise, it's relaxing then. Okay, so um, um, what, what happens is this. So it's kind of actually everyone can do this. Everyone can, I'm thinking like, try this kind of stuff. So the idea is very simple. If you go to, if you go deep into the papers, so there's a precision matrix and these guys in the mathematics, I think, or statistics, they derive a formula for element by element for the precision matrix. And you can drive it actually. It's not that, that super difficult, I think. Um, so, and um, what they do next is they're gonna kind of like impose sparsity when the estimating in the large asset case or large dimension case. Why you need sparsity? Because if you don't assume sparsity, you cannot do anything in the P larger than M world. So your, your answers will be like diverging, not consistent, it will be crazy. So by imposing sparsity, you, you kind of, um, kind of um, destroy this kind of behavior. So what does it mean? Uh, yeah, you can use basically a very simple lasso and node-wise regression will be tied to lasso estimation. Uh, we are gonna see that. So, um, but it doesn't mean that the covariance matrix of excess asset returns are sparse. So we are talking about its inverse, not, not itself. So uh, what does it mean? What is the restriction? What is the sparsity restriction or so-called weak sparsity restriction in, the, in, in node-wise regression? This is the main restriction. It's a conditional independence restriction. It's not independence. So it means that if you have a stock, IBM, it's, it will be related to all computer software, hardware stocks but it will be less depending upon other industry stocks. So this is, this is the restriction. So in other words, you're gonna have a portfolio and your portfolio will be related to some of them a little bit and then less to the other part. Um, so it will not be like heavily related. It, you cannot have like a huge heavily related um, 
portfolio. You cannot have like all technology stocks uh, heavily related to each other, then I think this, this assumption will fail and whatever you do will fail. So this, this is a restriction of the analysis in that sense. So, um, so this, this is basically condition independence. Of course, it doesn't mean that zero correlation. It means that some small correlation allowed for the others and that some larger correlation for the others. And in the paper, we show that the stock market of US kind of like shows this in two separate incidents, uh, two recession, two major periods that we analyzed. So uh, since I have time, what I can do is like, I, I would like to look at the precision metrics formula. So this is coming from mathematics. So you kind of like, have the covariance metrics. So this is expectation. If you have um, zero mean uh, Xi, it will be Xi expectation Xi Xi transpose. Otherwise you have to demean of course. So basically you're interested in its inverse. So this is a population inverse. And what you can do is you can use like partition regression. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, and then inverse formula for matrices. So we can get the main diagonal element and we can get the so-called J trove element without the main diagonal elements removed in two. So you have two formulas. But if you look at these two formulas, it's kind of like, um, uh, it's kind of related to <laughs> what we kind of um, do in a simple regression. So um, if you tie this to finance specifically, let's assume that I'm interested in excess asset return and this is asset J and there I have all the other assets in my portfolio, everything else. So, um, I'm going to define something called gamma J. Gamma J will be basically the population regression of the uh, asset returns regressed on everything else, all the other assets. And I can show that this is the solution. Uh, equation three is the solution. And this is it's, it's not specific to, uh, returns. It can be applied to any regression context. So if you look at here carefully, so this is a simple regression, but it's all related to, again, these uh, matrix algebra, um, and if you look at carefully, if you go back to two, you're going to see that this gamma J pops up here. So what do we learn? It's kind of very simple. Basically, J trove of the precision metrics can be taken as its, its main diagonal element multiplied by a regression coefficient. So it's kind of like, you kind of see what's going on. If the regression coefficient, if regression vector is sparse, then the row of the precision metrics will be sparse. So hence, you can kind of tie these these two things to, together. So it's called node-wise regression. So it's, there's a node and nodes regress on the others. And to see, you like to see where your neighbors are. So node-wise regression tells you're finding a neighborhood, your neighborhood, your neighborhood is the guys or girls that you talk a lot. And then everybody else is not in your neighborhood. It will be truncated to zero or some small coefficient. So um, what we need in the, in the so-called uh, regression relationship is basically the covariate, the main covariate should be orthogonal to the so-called error terms, artificial error term eta. Uh, this, is, this is the key in the proofs. You need that. Without that, you cannot go, uh, of course, in node-wise regression. And node-wise regression is kind of like related to strict stationarity, linear systems, and then IID networks, uh, and if it's not IID, it has to be stationary. And linearity is a key here. If it goes in a different direction, like we did with Anders, I think maybe he's, he's, he's listening to me. In the case of like, uh, even in linear GMM, the, the moment equations are complicated, you cannot use in, in uh, node-wise regression, like, like uh, in, in a simple way, uh, like we do here. So node-wise regression has its limits. Um, so, so, um, there's a regression relationship. So we kind of like um, see that. Um, um, so I'm just trying to uh, and look at the main diagonal term in the precision matrix and reciprocally of that will be called tau j square. And what we are seeing here is basically the main diagonal, if you look at the precision matrix, we are, I'm looking at the row of one specific j trove of this precision matrix. Its main diagonal term will be one over uh, tau j square and its row will be this again, uh, the regression coefficient divided by tau j squared. So if I can estimate tau j and then as well as gamma, I will be estimating the row. If I stack the rows, I will be estimating the precision matrix. So this is the node-wise regression estimation idea. It's very simple. Um, so this is coming from, this will come from a simple regression. We know that. And we are gonna pin down a formula for this for tau j squared. So tau j squared is here. So we're gonna estimate this guy here. Um, and if we, when we do that, we'll be done in the sense that um, we can kind of get a constant estimate for this row. And then uh, we are going to add up the rows, which will uh, have a 
we will have an answer. So we are going to define theta. So this is the precision matrix sigma inverse, remember? So we are going to define a matrix, a P by P matrix. Its main algorithms will be one. Uh, and then its rows will be all these regression coefficient vectors. So we regress to the first asset and the others. This is your so-called regression, population regression coefficient. And you do for second asset and the other second row, P asset and the others, this is the P row. And what we have is of course, we have to standardize with tau squared um, so that um, we have the main diagonal term as one over tau squared. So this is the theta formula. So like I said, we need to estimate thetas uh, in a way that we need to estimate taus and we need to estimate gammas. Gamma is coming from regression. And then uh, if we impose sparsity, it will come from sparse regression, which we'll do through lens. So, and this will be tied to regression context. We have to find a formula for tau square, of course, which is more difficult, I should say. So what is node-wise regression? Node-wise regression is basically tied to this um, idea of precision matrix estimation. Any questions before, before I go on? No? I'm good. Oh, there's one. So can you see the question? We have one question. Yeah, let me just uh, try to open up if possible. Uh, well-defined groups that uh, as uh, well-defined groups of returns. Hmm. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So um, I'm thinking like group less. So um, maybe you need to. Um, maybe you can answer, then, uh, then everybody can, uh, verbally you can answer, everybody can hear. I mean, okay, uh, okay. Yeah. okay so um, le le I mean, I. I have like, actually I'm working on a paper now, which is kind of like trying to do that. I work like I'm, I'm finishing almost like a paper, a single paper. So it's a good question. I mean, I searched this a lot and the one way of solving is change the node wise regression formula from one node to multiple nodes and run like a group of nodes on other group of nodes. So if you know what you're doing, if you know, if you're interested in certain groups on the others, yeah, I think this is doable. and. In the literature, in the stats literature, they use um, they use this multivariate uh, square root lasso with uh, with a different penalty function. So their their uh, multivariate node wise regression is an entirely different formula. But it's, it's kind of like um, if you, everything simplifies back to what I do in the, in the node wise. So what I'm myself is doing is slightly different than what they're doing now. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the say that I'm interested in certain group of assets. So I'm looking at the rows specific rows. And I'm running node-wise regression on those rows only. And then, then uh, so-called, you can penalize the, penalize the groups that you're interested in only, and you don't penalize your own group. This is what I, I tried. Uh, I'm not gonna put in the paper, but this is one possible approach that might work. This is what I think um, as, a second, uh, as a second approach. Um, but like, I didn't like, in, in the case of statistics, they have proofs for the others. Uh, in my case, I don't have the proof for that. Um, so um, yeah, so the answer is um, it is doable, but you need to change the formula. Yes. There's another question. Okay. Uh, is it okay? So like, um, I think- Yes, I you can continue. Okay, Thanks. sure. So um, um, let me just continue. This, this is, um, so the, I mean, this is, like I said, this is just running one node on the others. Uh, you can change the formula to like a group here, another group there, and then your, your penalty function should change that uh, a little bit. So it can be done. There are papers by Sarah Van der Geer and Benjamin Stuckey. They do that in Sarah Van der Geer's book in 2016. They also talk about that, um, but all their stuff is fixed uh regresses so their approach is extremely limited this is what i figured out uh, unfortunately their stuff doesn't work when you stray away from um their 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 sense uh maybe somebody else could could write a paper on this uh with the random regressors with random groups um their stuff is involving normal errors fixed regressors and it makes their life easier uh, otherwise the stuff doesn't work there 
So um, like I said, my other approach, my other possibility is like run node wise regression, but penalize only the groups that, that uh, you are not interested in. Um, so here, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna of course choose the lambdas. Lambdas will be chosen through cross-validation or some kind of like information criterion that, that we propose in our paper with honors. Um, um, so what I'm gonna denote the number of non-zeros the maximum number of zeros in any given row is S bar. So if you, I'm gonna look at the precision matrix, I'm gonna look at all the rows and I'm gonna check the number of non-zeros and the maximum number of non-zeros overall the precision matrix will be called S bar. So there's, um, and we can get a formula for tau J squared. So if you run lasso here, um, like, like I said, um, uh, on the J return on the, all the others and then penalize it, and so basic objective functions value is tau j squared. So it's good news for us. So we have a formula for tau j squared in terms of lasso. So we can estimate everything. So we can estimate the precision matrix. So this is all coming from Buhlmann and Mainz 2006 and as of statistics paper. So this is not my invention. So I'm just repeating whatever they did. The issue is whether it will work in finance. <laughs> So one thing that, that we face is uh, in, in our other paper with another group of uh, co-authors that I have, and the referees didn't like the IID nature of what we did with honors or independent data. So they wanted the time series uh, component. So yeah, I mean, there's, it's possible to have these in time series, but it's, it's a little bit like restrictive on the restrictions. So we, we are gonna allow for beta mixing if you allow for beta mixing and if you allow for like really uh, all the moments are there kind of idea, um, then you can have, you can have basically um, um, so-called non-wise regression estimation as consistent. And that's not our paper. So there's a recent paper in Journal of Econometrics, Chang and I think in LSE, in statistics department, he was able to solve with his co-authors the problem that we, we did in the independent uh, linear regression context with honors they solved it for the time series data. I put these assumptions, three assumptions, and if they have these three assumptions from their paper, so this is their theorem one from, uh, lemma one from their paper, they're able to show that you can constantly estimate each row of the precision metrics. Um, so you can do precision metrics estimation in time series data, as long as it's beta mixing and then obeying this moment conditions. So we're gonna use their theorem heavily. We're gonna use their theorem heavily. So. Um, what I'm what I'm doing here is now I'm starting with the kind of like the most important result is the maximum out of sample sample sharp ratio, and then try to kind of like um, um, show the formula with no basic no constraints. This is what you get a uh, number seven. It's the target return precision matrix target return. So it's like target return squared uh, divided by um, coincidence matrix square root. And in out of sample, basically we only estimate the weights and then we don't estimate basically in the formula target return and sigma. So this is, this is what they do in finance. So we're gonna use that uh, their, uh, formula. And when we did this and then when we put the node wise regression here, so node wise regression is put in here, instead of sigma hat inverse, we have theta hat, theta hat, theta hat. And mu hat is uh, basically average return of the portfolio. We didn't use any lasso there. Then this is what you got. So you got a result. Uh, your basic node-wise regression rate of convergence is basically the same uh, convergence rate here. So since these are growing, you have to subdivide each other and uh, subtract from one rather than subtract from each other. So you subdivide. This is the difference in finance. You have to basically, this is what we figured out in the other paper as well. Um, so you have to basically uh, take into account that they're, they're both growing and then, then or sometimes they're, they're going to zero very fast. So to control that, you have to like uh, take a ratio and then show that they're not different from one. And uh, apart from the other literature, we are able to show the rate of convergence. So rate of convergence shows that the number of assets doesn't bite you that much. It doesn't bite you in a polynomial, it bites you in a logarithmic rate, which is good news. But of course the precision metrics plays a role if everything is non-sparse, if this S star S bar is P, then you can only have P less than N, actually P less than square root N. So if there's pure non-sparsity, if you have a humongously correlated portfolio, you'd better not have it uh, in, in terms of large numbers of assets uh, because your estimation and everything will be really failing. Uh, so you only like, if you have like 100 time periods, I say you put like 10 stocks. 
uh, in that center if they're heavily correlated. If they're not heavily correlated, if you kind of have a super large portfolio, like some portions correlated with other, but not that much, uh, the correlations are low. There's a certain group with large correlation. Yeah, this will work fine. So um, what are the other papers that show um, uh, maximum out of sharp ratio? Later Wolf shows it. There's a limit as a function of maximum out of sample sharp ratio, but it's a, it's a limit for loss function. It's not a consistency proof. Um, so they allow non-sparsity, but they cannot allow P and N close to each other. The limit depends upon shrinkage factor. They optimize the limit according to shrinkage factor, find a uh, feasible estimate. Uh, on the other hand, Ying Ying Li proves the case, proves this result when P is less than N. Returns are normally distributed, but in their case, P is less than N, and they don't get rid of convergence. I think they just show consistency. So um, we can have P is equal to N. We can have P is equal to N squared and we can kind of have all these things. And we also allow time series data in our theorems, which they didn't. They either allowed IID or normal data sets. Uh, so we are able to come up with this time series, even in a limited context, we're able to come up with the time series data. Um, and we allow P larger than N, P divided by N even can go to infinity in our case, we allow that. So we can, you can have a smaller uh, time period, like 200 observations and then you have like thousand uh, I said. So another point is whether we have mean variance efficiency when P is larger and there's no result like that in the literature. So we are able to establish that uh, we can have mean variance efficiency. So mean variance efficiency of R in P less than N extends to P larger than N when you change the technique. Uh, again, we can have also rate of convergences. And then um, coming back to the other question, yeah, our portfolio variance is uh, finite and fixed. So um, so we have all these results. So this, this is a new result. So uh, the second part of the paper goes on a different tack and then try to show whether we can analyze like um, um, constrained maximum sharp ratios. And the answer will be yes. So what we're gonna do is like I, like I said, we're gonna propose a new maximum sharp ratio there. We are gonna take into account the technical term that I described before. And we are gonna estimate the technical term with their components. Mu will be mu hat. Sigma hat inverse will be estimated by uh, theta hat. And of course, uh, we have to be very careful. We are going to impose some restriction though. We cannot estimate as, as, as it is. Uh, we are going to use exactly the same assumptions, but we need one more condition. And that condition is basically this technical term divided by P should be larger than or equal to C, and that will be larger than two epsilon. And epsilon is a given number. So we're going to, we're going to find out what epsilon is. Uh, we can still estimate the constant maximum sharp ratio. It's the exact the same rate as the rate of error is the same as, as a regular sharp ratio. The epsilon is, the, is a very small number. We can estimate, we can exactly get what epsilon is, and we can also get the rate of the epsilon. Epsilon is going to zero at a certain rate, this same rate as rate of convergence. And what is this condition? Uh, what does it tell? Uh, basically, this condition is not that restricted. It's basically telling us that mu divided, mu basically uh, divided by the sigma inverses and summed up divided by p shouldn't be going to zero in absolute value. What does it mean? It kind of like tells that you cannot have like a super balanced portfolio. Like you cannot have like large uh, negative correlations bunched up with uh, large positive correlations. Yeah, I think then, then I, this will be close to zero and you will be like uh, in a bad position. So, um, but I think it's a minor restriction. There are not too many portfolios like that, um, like super balanced portfolios. I think a super balanced portfolio will kind of destroy this assumption. So um, the combine, combined constraint formula by taking the account technical term is new. Um, so we can estimate this, we can estimate this portfolio given these like four, four assumptions plus this condition of like, uh, not a super balanced portfolio. Um, and so this is, a, this is a new result in that sense. So we are happy about that. Um, so we also analyzed two other sharp ratios and people use global minimum variance in the simulations and they, they use this a lot and they have results for this in the literature. So it's not new that we are doing. We are doing the node-wise regression context. Markowitz, we couldn't find results before. So we have a Markowitz mean variance portfolio result. This is a new result. I don't, we didn't see any factor model or shrinkage paper that analyzes that even though in the simulations they show it's doable. There's no proof that we have seen per se. So I'm gonna go to uh, simulations. So, and then I'm gonna have also like uh, empirical exercise. So we have two data genetic processes. One is a toplets 
and one is a factor model. Toplitz favors us because it will be sparse factor model favors factor model, of course, and we'll see how, how each case do. So we have like um, Toplitz result with uh, small correlation, medium and large correlation. And we are, I'm gonna look at in this, um, in the paper, paper is an archive, so you can download the paper itself. Paper has lots of uh, simulations, uh, results. So I'm gonna to look at a subset. I'm gonna look at the constraint maximum sharp ratio and out of uh, sample maximum sharp ratio only. So, um, and then this correlation is 0.5. Uh, in the paper, there are lots of lots of uh, different specifications, but the results are very, very similar. So in the constraint case, this is node-wise GIC. So we are using information criterion for picking the tuning parameter. And this is node-wise cross-validation. Um, and the third one is poet. It's a factor model of FEN in 2013 Journal of Econometrics. And Nonlinear Leather Wolf model is in a review of financial studies in 2017. And single factor nonlinear Leather Wolf. There is no theory for this, but it worked excellently in their simulations in their RFS paper. So we included that. And Maxer is ours, Maxer paper. It's a hybrid lasso slash factor model paper in review of financial studies. So when we kind of like look at the results, we see that our kind of like a sharp ratio is, uh, so our, our, these are our error, error terms and our error terms is much smaller than the, our, our rivals here uh, with basically P less than N. And when we check up P larger than N, we kind of see the results are even getting, uh, uh, getting kind of like better for us in the sense that their error terms are very high, especially in the factor model uh, for factor model susceptible to that. So all of them um, out of sample case, especially if the out of sample case, you see the error terms are very high in the other rivals. And the best is the GIC based uh, node wise regression. So cross validation comes second. So this is simulation, remember, so it's all in sample. So GIC does extremely well, um, yeah, node wise based GIC. And when we jack up N to 400 and then P to 600, results stay the same. We do very well, our errors are small and their errors are very large. But remember, I mean, their stuff didn't go for like um, maximum sharp ratio um, in this context. So even Maxer, which is P less than N case, which is what uh, in their context, they didn't do as well in the scenario compared to us. Uh, they didn't do as well. So let me just go, yeah, they actually did um, worse. Uh, so um, errors decline with large PNN. And in our case, the, our errors decline from 0.17 to 0 0.09 when we kind of jack up our combinations with smaller P to large P. And we don't see for the other, other methods that there's decline. Their errors are large. For, first of all, it's like 0.969. It's basically like um, uh, six times larger than us. And then when you jack up the numbers, uh, PNN, their errors are like stabilized in 0.96. So it's like 10 times larger. And Leather Wolf's method does slightly better, but still it's very large. So our methods come first and second, but this is, remember, this in sample toplet, very sparse. Uh, so it validates our theorems. So if you go to factor model, if the life is factor model, French one, three factors, and um, a realistic simulation setup, then we do terrible. Yeah, we do terrible. So if you kind of look at the, the constraint maximum sharp ratio, we're not too far away from the others, but when you go out of sample, uh, we do really terrible compared to everything else. And Maxer does very well. So this is exactly like you see in their paper. They do extremely well compared to everything else. They're beating everything like crazy well. And same here, their error terms are so smaller. Um, so um, this is kind of validating their paper. And then second one is uh, single factor Ledo Wolf. So this is exactly like what we see in the other papers uh, in terms of ranking. And we do terrible. Uh, if the life is factor amounts, we, it will not be a good idea for node-wise regression. Of course, then the issue is like, what's going on in real life? I have two, two uh, heat maps that shows that uh, uh, it's mapping very well with the node-wise regression idea. So let's see what's going on. So first we look at the out of sample period 2005 to 2017, and in sample is 1995 to December 2004. Uh, so we are kind of like doing this out of sample exercise. So we did 50 stocks, small portfolio, and then we did 383 stocks, larger portfolio. P is larger than N case. Um, so our range is, of course, the in-sample period here. So um, if you look at the sharp ratio here, ours is the best. So, and then Poet comes close second. 
And then when you jack up the number of stocks, the larger portfolio, uh, if you look at a lot of the, like Vanguard portfolios and everything, a lot of portfolios have large number of assets now. You don't have like 10 or 20. A lot of times you have like even larger numbers than this. Um, so the sharp ratio is much higher and POET comes again, the second compared to our methods. And the p-value wise, everything is similar to each other. It kind of like surprised me, but I'm not so sure whether these like, um, p-value calculations are correct in the high dimensional case. So we use whatever the uh, other papers use, but I'm not, I haven't, I haven't read the papers because they are written like 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and we did like two of them, like one with Michael Wolf's stuff with bootstrap and then one with uh, another, another correction and p-values are very similar to each other, but I, I have to look at those papers. I don't know whether they are really super reliable. So when we go to another uh, out of sample period, like two recessions now, rather than one recession, uh, starting in 21st century, immediately until like December, 2018, two recessions and um, basically 2000, uh, 2000, uh, I mean, so-called stock market meltdown uh, and then the recession 2008. Then our sharp pressure is again, the largest, again, our sharp pressure is the largest in a smaller number of stocks and larger number of stocks and then um, so we do, we do pretty well. And then uh, if you look at here, something that's surprising, max here is uh, negative. And we have other, other results in the paper. This is a subset. So these are all assuming transaction costs. Without the transaction costs, of course, the results are different. Um, so our method does the best in terms of uh, sharp ratio. This is a Markowitz portfolio. Um, and differences are smaller in small portfolios, but when you go larger portfolios, differences are becoming larger. And it's, it seems like the max error method affects very badly with transaction costs. So if you, if you look at how they turn over their stuff, you kind of like think, see that things are not going very well for them. So this is what we did. We, we, we were curious what's going on behind these results. And we like to look at the turnover leverage, maximum leverage. Turnover is how much you're changing your stocks and you want these numbers to be low. If you look at max error, their turnover is terrible. It's super high. And our turnover with POET, the factor model of FAN is very low. And here again, uh, our model with GIC and then POET's factor model is, is uh, low. And then we have seen other simulations, in other papers that I have done. Uh, our method and POET's method is very stable. It doesn't do crazy stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, if you're concerned about turnover, leverage, maximum leverage, again, our method does very well. Um, even though we don't have proofs for that, we just have just like, um, um, results on results for that. So I think this is it. Am I early or there's a question? I'm mean, sorry. Can you repeat again? Yeah, we have one more question. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, t if theta is time varying. Yeah, the theta is, um, if the theta is time varying, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I think it's a, it's a good good idea for a new paper, I think. <laughs> so instead of having like a constant, I can see Anders. Maybe Anders can answer that. I don't know. Can you? <laughs> uh, you have to, you have to speak. You have to like uh, unmute, unmute yourself. I, yeah. I was strategically muting myself. <laughs> yeah. so, do you think the time varying stuff is there or is this a new paper? I haven't seen any papers about that, but yeah, I might be wrong. I think at least in a cross-sectional setting, you can allow for non-identically distributed data. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. I mean, my, the paper yeah. that I, I'm presenting, it we allow for beta mixing, strict stationarity. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything in a time series context, maybe in a, I think in a cross-sectional context, it's fine to uh, yeah. allow for non-identically distributed data. I haven't seen it in time series, though I haven't looked either. In, in time series, they allow strict stationarity only. They cannot go beyond strict stationarity. They cannot go from like strict stationary to non-stationary data. If, yeah, but can you allow for that? I don't know. I mean, I think the, the issue, I think in my mind, the issue will be more like you have a formula and then you're going to have a formula for time varying. So the, let me go back. Let me just explain what's going on. So in the, in the, in the time varying case, you have to, you have to go through these formulas. 
So you will have you will have a formula inverse formula for matrices. Now you are gonna have like a time varying component and um, how it will affect everything. I don't know. In the strict stationary data, there is no effect. But like in in the non stationary world, I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea how the, how the things will work out. Um, it's, it's unclear to me. Um, yeah. I mean, one possibility is like you first difference the data and then run uh, whatever we do. If you if you think your your uh, returns are like non stationary, you would like to still use this idea. Um, but yeah, then it means you are looking at first difference in returns, not the returns themselves. Okay. So, um, any other questions? Uh, Mehmet, we don't we don't see any additional question right now. We just uh, we had uh, Federico ask that question. You uh, okay? That's that's it. Are we having a break or does it mean I should start a bit early? <laughs> we have 10 more minutes if you want to go. I, I did, uh, did you, you didn't complete your presentation yet, right? Me? Oh, I completed, I'm done. You are done? No, okay. I'm yeah. sorry, so I, I didn't, I, I, I thought that you, you have, still you have, okay. And uh, we have, uh, we, we don't have, uh, did we receive any email or no, we didn't receive any email. Uh, well, thank you very much. I mean, I don't think we should, uh, some people are going to come, I mean, people are picking uh, specific presentations and Anders is, the, the presentation is going to start at noon. So that's why if, if they pick uh, that presentation specifically, if we start early, that would be a little bit uh, situation, but uh, at least we can, we can, if you want, and there's, we can set up yourself and then, and maybe you can start a couple of minutes earlier or I'll wait, I'll wait a few more minutes. I can Mehmet, wait. Especially as you have a couple of more minutes, like, can you give a general advice or recommendation people who want to work on these topics? In, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah that concentrate or who they can read or what they can do. I mean, uh, I kind of like going like two directions. One possibility is whether you like to go applied or whether you like to go more theory. Um, I mean, of course, there, there are papers by, there are a lot of, one issue is you can go in the paper route. You can kind of like try to go a specific paper. If you're interested in treatment effect, you can try to like kind of go into treatment effect, the first paper and then see what you understand. And I mean, there was a presentation yesterday by Stefan Wager, I think, like it was excellent. Like you kind of see how it's done and then like, it's very simple. Uh, it was a very, very nice presentation. Um, so, I mean, you can always try to go in that direction. If you're gonna go for theory, of course, you have to read books. I, I, that will be my preference. Um, there are books by Sarah Van de Geer. I, I highly recommend that. So she has a book by herself and she has a book by um, Peter Bullman. And I think those two books are excellent. Um, so this, this is how usually I learn. And then there's also like a now um, Springer Verlag, like, like a, not Springer Verlag, like it's a, like a volume of um, journal, uh, Handbook of Econometrics by Victor Chernozikov, Alex Belloni in their website, uh, uh, Victor's website. You can kind of download it and look at it. It's very simple written, it's very well. If you like to go for theory, it's, it's a very good, and it shows the tools, how it's applied. It's usually written very well, um, so I will say, I will say that's very good. Of course, like if you want to, if you want to go like step by step and learn everything step by step in least squares format, our, I will say I can make this uh, advertisement for our joint paper with Anders in Journal of Econometrics. It's it's written in a way that if you don't know anything, if you want to understand every step, yeah, that you can do it. We have written in that specific say, way, and we try not to miss any step, even if it's like two plus two is equal to four, be clear, <laughs> right? <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, Anders, as we have a couple of more minutes until you start, maybe uh, until waiting an audience specifically for your seminar, maybe also you can give some general advice. 
Oh, on the on. Uh, if you want to start the topics that you are interested in, where people should start, what they should do. Oh, okay. You mean about the talk I'm about to give, or about what Mehmet just talked about? In the topics that you are working, yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, what I'm will present today is uh, how to conduct a sequential uh, treatment allocation, and this literature is based on so-called banded problems. Um, which at their core have uh, an exploration exploitation trade-off. So uh, the people whom you want to treat, they arrive uh, sequentially. So uh, say you're a doctor, the first guy arrives in your office, you don't know which of two uh, treatments is the best one. You assign treatment A, say, you observe the outcome of treatment A, and now you have one piece of information. Then the second uh, individual arrives to your clinic, and now based on that one piece of information, you have to assign him to a treatment. And your goal is then, in the course of the say n equal to maybe 100 treatments that you make, is to treat as many individuals as well as possible. So there you now have a trade-off between on the one hand exploring the merits of uh, the treatments that are available. So you want to assign treatments A and B uh, often to explore the merits. But on the other hand, you don't want to waste too much time exploring. You also quickly want to zoom in on uh, the best of the available treatments and assign that as uh, well as possible. And uh, well, where can one read about this if you're still interested uh, in this topic after the talk? Well, a question just up my alley. There's a book came out just this year, 2020, on uh, bandit problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, it deals only with the case where you're interested in um, treatment effects uh, 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 about the mean. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is you're interested in other distributional characteristics and the mean, but this book here nevertheless is a nice introduction. It's just fresh out of the press this year. I don't get any commission. Uh, you can even find it for free on, uh, mm -hmm. on the website of one of the authors and I will mention the exact reference in my slides uh, again. So um, it looks good. I haven't had much time to read it since it's recently fresh, but it looks good. And I also mention another source which is freely available online later. Um, yeah. Okay, we can, we can, uh, Anders, you can stop actually. I mean, you can, you can start right now if you want. Okay. Sure. And uh, I'm going to stop recording right now. I'm going to restart again.